In this video, I'll be discussing strategies to model the forms of the face using shape-to-shape -shape lens. If you've watched the prior three videos in this series, then you'll know that a working knowledge of the pen tool is required to duplicate the techniques you'll see here. Let's start with a refresher on how shape-to-shape -shape lens work. We'll begin with a finished illustration, then work backwards to understand the techniques that were used. For the sake of time, I've already created several of the shapes we need. This is the body of the goldfish, and the first thing we do is assign a fill color. Make sure the foreground color is active, then apply a gold-orange color. Not a super creative choice for a goldfish, I admit. Just to make sure we don't accidentally move this shape, let's lock it, which is Command-2 on a Mac. We're going to refer to this as the base shape from now on. This will be the big blend shape. For this top one, we're going to make it a highlight, so give this shape the exact same gold color as the base shape. We don't see it anymore because it has the same color and it has no stroke. I've switched to the outline view, Command Y, so that we can see what's happening. We select this shape making sure to use the black selection tool, then copy it, command C, and paste in front, command F. This ensures that the second shape we make has exactly the same number of points as the first shape. We will then use the white selection tool to move the individual points in to create a smaller version sitting on top of the original shape. The further apart the paired points are, the softer the blend is going to be. The closer the paired points, the sharper the blend, the quicker it is going to change from one color to another. We want to be careful to not leave any handles overlapping, otherwise we get a situation like this. We'll shorten these handles to make sure they're not crossing over one another. While this small blend shape is still selected, give it a lighter version of the big blend shape color. If we select one of these sliders while holding down the shift key and drag to the left, all the colors will change proportionally and will get a tint of the original color. Now we switch to the black selection tool, select both the big blend shape and the small blend shape, and then go to Object, Blend, Make. Notice there's a keyboard shortcut for this. It's Option, Command, B on the Mac. If we decide we want this to be lighter or darker, we can make the small blend shape active with the white selection tool, then adjust the color. The blend will automatically adjust to the new color without us having to do all the steps over again. If we want this shape to be a shadow, we would make the small blend shape a darker version of the base shape. This technique works well when our blend doesn't go right to the edge of the base shape. When you do want it to go right to the edge, it's very difficult to try and match the existing outline with the pen tool. A better idea is to make a duplicate of the base shape and intersect it with the shape that will become the shadow. The reason we make a duplicate is that this area here is going to be eliminated during the intersection process, so we copy it, Command C, Paste in front, Command F, hold down the Shift key to select both shapes, then go to the Pathfinder palette and click Intersect. Now we have a big blend shape that reflects the top edge of the shadow we drew, and a bottom edge of the shadow created by the program that exactly matches the bottom of the base shape. Even if you're really good with the pen tool, trying to match this edge exactly by hand would be an extremely difficult and time-consuming task, especially when we can get Illustrator to do a better and faster job for us. As before, we have a base shape and a big blend shape. We'll now copy the big blend shape and use the white selection tool to make the small blend shape. We don't want this to have a black stroke, so take that off then fill the shape with the same color as the base shape. This is going to be the small blend shape, so we'll adjust the color of this shape to be a darker version of the big blend shape. Okay. 
Select both the big and small blend shapes and hit Command Option B to blend them together. Once again, the more distance you have between the shapes, the more soft and gradual the blend is going to be. This technique works well when your base shape color is solid, but it doesn't work when you have a variety of colors or a pattern in the base shape. Here's an example of what I mean. Let's select the base and give it a pattern fill. We can see here that the big blend shape can't transition smoothly to the base shape because the base shape fill has more than one color in it. We've seen the solution to this in previous videos. We select both parts of the highlight blend and assign them a white color. Now we need to make sure this is a specified steps blend rather than a smooth color blend. It is in fact already specified at 254 steps. However, the higher the number of steps, the less likely the blend will have banding in it. So let's bump this up all the way to 1000, which is the maximum. Select the big blend shape with the white selection tool before using the transparency palette to set the opacity to zero. The small blend shape is now too hot. We can change the opacity of this shape to something less than 100%, say a 50% blend going down to 0%, or we can use the black selection tool to activate the two shapes together to reduce the opacity of the overall blend. The shadows require less work to do. We can use smooth color blends without having to convert them to specified steps. We assign the color black to the small blend shape and white to the big blend shape. We don't have to set the white to transparent because setting the blend mode to multiply will automatically make the white transparent. We can adjust the intensity of the blend by adjusting the opacity the same way we did with the highlight. We're using black for the dark part of the blend, but we don't have to. Any color will do. We could start with our base orange and add some black to it, resulting in a shadow with a warm orange tint. You might find you like the subtle sophistication of this a little bit better than using just plain black. Here's a couple of issues we might run into as we do shape-to-shape -shape blends. You might be thinking, why do that whole copy, paste in front, move the points process? Can't we just make a smaller copy of the big blend shape using the scale tool? Let's try it and see what happens. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in situations like this. Even if we used Illustrator's offset path feature, it still doesn't work because the resulting smaller shape would not have the same number of points as the original. Let's set this up for a blend to illustrate the potential problems when blending a shape like this. The two shapes have the same number of path points, but I've intentionally placed several of the small blend shape points incorrectly. When we blend them together, we see some unexpected weirdness. What we're seeing is that this point is partnered with this point, but the angle of the two in relation to the overall blend is too extreme. If we adjust the points even further away from each other, we observe that the blends will not follow around a curve either. The blends will always go directly in a straight line from one point path to the other. These two points are working perfectly. With these two, ideally this one should be down here. This one should be way down here. I drew this originally with the minimum number of points necessary to define the forms, but sometimes when we're doing shape-to-shape -shape blends, it's helpful in an area like this to have more points right at the end of these curves. If you want this end transition to be really soft, the extra points allow you to have lots of space between the two paths while still keeping these points together. Now we can see that this is blending much better now than this one. Let me get off topic here for a moment because I know some people will wonder if I did the fins with shape-to-shape -shape blends. The answer is no. This was done with gradient mesh, similar to what we did with the lips in the previous video. What we do is draw the shape of the fin, then use that shape as a clipping mask to hide the mesh except within the fin shape. So, make sure that the fin shape is in front, select both shapes, then Object, Clipping Mask, Make, 
then send the clip shapes to the back. This is also how I created these shapes here. Before we proceed to doing the shape-to-shape -shape blends on the face, we need to create a range of skin tone colors. Adobe gives us some help with this. If we go to Window, Swatch Libraries, Skin Tones, we can see several sets of flesh tones in varying value ranges. What we are seeing here is these colors here. As we look at the CMYK mix of the individual colors, we see that each one has a little bit of black in it. I find that lighter skin tones don't blend well with black in the mix. What I've done here is to make my own set with similar shading but no black in them. If you want to start from scratch, you can use the eyedropper tool to sample a light and a dark skin tone from the reference photo. It doesn't always yield good results, but let's try it. Let's say this is the lightest color I see on the face of the reference photo, and this is an example of the darkest color on the face. I want to create the intermediate steps, so what I do at this point is say 1, 2, 3, 4. I want four intermediate steps. Select these two colors, then Object, Blend, Blend Options, Specified Steps is going to be set to four, then make the blend. If I want to add these to my swatches palette, I need to expand the blend, then ungroup the individual shapes. With the swatches panel open, I can create a new folder to keep all the skin tones in one place. By clicking on each shape, I can then drag the color into the folder. If I want a different view, I can change to the list view, which allows me to name each color, face 01, face 02, and so on in order of value change from light to dark. Every person's skin tone is a little different. Some will be lighter, some will be darker. Even after you're completely finished with the blends, it's really easy to make changes. Let's say all the blends using this color don't work. I could just select the color and go to Select, Same, Fill Color, and anywhere that color is used in the whole illustration will be selected which then would allow me to come in and say, okay, this needs to be a little bit more yellow, this needs to be a little bit more red, and it's automatically going to adjust the selected color. Saves a lot of time. After all that set up, we're now going to start looking at how we'll be laying out the blends for the face. As always, careful observation of the reference photo will help us make good decisions. The first blend shape is the most critical. Ideally, you want to encompass as many shadow areas as you can in one big blend. And looking at the photo, we can see that the light is coming from the right, where it's hitting the forehead to create a very broad, gradual change of value. The shadow is going to move down the forehead towards the brow, follow along the line of the eyebrow, move down and around under the lower eyelid, up across the bridge of the nose, down the left side of the nose toward the ball at the end, across the lips to curve in an S shape at the chin, then left towards the hairline. Don't worry about the left cheek highlight. We can come back and add it on top of the left side face shadow later. I've changed the colors of the path so that you can see them a little better. Obviously, you would not use these colors for the actual blends. The red line is the first path that I drew. Using the terminology from our blending intro, this would be the big blend shape. The green line, the small blend shape, was copied, pasted in front, and moved point by point to the position you see now. In areas like this, we don't have to worry too much about how the blend is behaving because the eyebrow will be covering it up. Looking at the area under the eyebrow, we see it is lighter, so there needs to be more distance between the lines. The pouch under the eye needs to be fairly close together. Some fairly soft transitions on the side of the nose. We're going to take care of this shading later with an additional shadow on top of this first shadow. 
The lines need to be pretty close together here, so this is going to be a pretty sharp edge. Again, we don't have to worry about what's going on here because the lips will cover up the blend. What's going on over here doesn't really matter at all, as long as we have the same number of points, because the hair is covering this area of the blend. This is what it looks like when the first shadow is added to the face base, and we can already see the forms of the face coming into view. After we do this first blend, we can't see through to the reference photo to know where to draw the next blend shapes. Let me remind you about this layer management tip. If you hold down on the Command key and click on the eye icon of individual layers, they will turn into the outline view, while the reference photo stays in preview mode. Once we create the shadow blends, we have some options when modifying them. Right now, this is set to a 100% opacity, transitioning to a 0% opacity. We can set the blend mode to multiply, which will make it darker. If we think it's too dark, we can lighten it up by manipulating the opacity back and forth to find the right look. You can do this technique with all shadows, as well as highlights, except for the multiply technique, which doesn't work with lighter colors. As we look at the photo further, we see that you've got some even darker shadows in here and down here, and the way that we're going to address those is to create another set of shapes where the blend either blends to the darker shape or blends to transparent and sits on the dark, darker shape set to multiply. Let me show you what that looks like. Since each face is different, I don't know how helpful it would be to show every step of the process of building all the shadows and highlights, but this sequence may help shed some light on the way that I do it. I build the shadows and highlights up from the base layer using the reference photo as a guide. I did the shadows first and the highlights second, but you can do them in any order that makes sense to you. In most cases, I want to try to keep the edges of shape-to-shape -shape blends from overlapping unless my blends are set to multiply or I'm using transparency. Let me show you just a few more little tricks and then we'll call it a day. Sometimes we need to create a very thin highlight or shadow. What we've done before is to take a stroke and add a Gaussian blur to it and knock down the opacity a little bit. The only drawback with this is the edges are going to be consistent all the way around. If we want to have a little bit more flexibility with that, what we can do is add a gradient to the stroke if we have a newer version of Illustrator. Let me show you what this looks like. What we're seeing is four color wells all set to white, but the wells on the outside also have their opacity set to 0%. This allows us to adjust the wells to make the highlight more to one side or the other. This is going to be softer, this is going to be sharper. Once we get the gradient situated, we can apply the Gaussian blur to get this result. It's a subtle difference but a lot of little bits of extra sophistication can add up to a markedly better illustration. Traditional illustrators will sometimes put a black outline around some of the major shapes to help separate the foreground elements from the background elements. I kind of like that look and I want to adapt it for this illustration, but I have to be careful that I don't have a line here that is all one thickness because it tends to look too mechanical. What I do is make a copy of the face base shape and change it to a black stroke with no fill. Now I use the Width tool to add variety to the line. Click on the path and drag out to make it thicker. Click in another spot and drag in to make it thinner. I've chosen to make the line thinner on the top and thicker across the bottom, but you can do it any way that makes sense to you. For example, you might decide that the cheekbone will have a highlight, so make the line thinner, and the eye socket will be darker, so make it thicker. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you stuck with me so far, I ask that you see it through to the end and watch the fifth and last video, where I will show you how to do hair. Bye for now.